This is like my second time being here ever. And I'm really, really like appreciative of like the reception and the love that um, my ideas and my intellectual properties have gotten thus far. Like this has been pretty crazy and yeah, I'm really appreciative of you know all the love and everything. So um, shoot, I, I guess I should get started on, you know, my name and you know why I started this whole art thing and stuff like that. So Obviously, hi, I'm Trotter Alexander. Um, um, yeah, I, today I wanted to talk about, you know, where my art has come from um, and more or less about why I chose the topic of this exhibition. So, um, generally, a good chunk of my life has been centralized around, like, the, the Chicagoland area, you know, going to Chicago a lot, um, being influenced by my dad and my mom for my own artistic processes, you know, they're very artsy people. So I had the luxury of growing up in an artsy house where when I say to my parents, hey, I wanna be an artist, they actually can understand that. And, um, you know, my, my dad has just like been very hit with like the culture in Chicago and everything like that. So he would give me a bunch of, you know, Keith Haring books <clears throat> to uh, put me onto like a Kehinde Wiley, give me some books about a, a, a John Singer Sargent and like a bunch of these very eloquent and expressive artists that I would, you know, accumulated my art style to this day. Um, and my mom was actually an artist too before I was actually born. And that actually is how I got into this whole art thing. Um, I was um, in my uh, playroom and I saw like this art piece and I inquired about it because like that was the first time I saw an art piece that like didn't have a figure in it. It wasn't a face. I was like, all right, what is this? What does this mean? And uh, sh she told me that, you know, my, she would come up with like a bunch of like squiggly lines and my dad would come up with the fill. And the significance of that is, you know, prior to um, me being alive, my dad and my mom were happily married and they were together, but unfortunately I never got to see that. So for me to actually see that painting, that was like real tangible evidence of their unison once upon a time. So of course, you know, I do art because my mom does art and I want my mom's love and approval. So I'm like, all right, cool, I'm about to do this. And I remember it was when Avatar The Last Airbender came out. And I made Aang, but like he was black, you know what I mean? And my mom's like, oh, this is so dope and everything. And um, you know, that encouraged me to draw more because you know, I love my mom and my father and they were my world. And you know, if my world is proud of me, then of course I'm going to keep going and doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. And thankfully being in the Chicagoland area, you know, you have a bunch of dope uh, contemporaries that look like me. You you have a, a Max Sansing, uh, a Kayla Mahafe, a Hugh Brantley, just to name a few. And you can tell of, at least for the people who really consumes art on a day-to-day -day basis, how the motifs and the brush strokes and the color palettes are somewhat urban. They're more vibrant. They're not really uh, institutionalized, even though I can practice institutionalized or academic like realism and such, but that wasn't normally where my focus was at. My focus wasn't in studies. My focus wasn't to try to replicate what I've seen or try to make a, an extremely Eurocentric style, you know, realistic study of the way that I saw the world. That wasn't my focus. My focus was, you know, growing up, you know, I didn't have access to be vocal with my experiences. So the only other way for me to express myself was through this. You know, this was my secret hiding place. This was like my secret treasure that, you know, every day, every night, it would be the only thing for like an hour, for two hours that would truly make sense to my youthful mind. So as you can understand, you know, that culture definitely, you know, got me and pushed me to the point where I'm here now. And um, yeah, I was like really dope to psyched out to actually have this opportunity here. So, <clears throat> so, um, I remember when I was with my uh, dad and he one time, he out of the blue, like out of nowhere just asked me like at age 11, how do you want to utilize your art to contribute to society? And as you can imagine, those are a lot of big words for an 11 year old. But he kept asking me this and asking me this and asking me this and you know, art only started and stopped at like my sketches, it was, it was supposed to be my little journal. I don't know how this was going to contribute to society. And then I grow, I grew older, I grew more wiser, and I understood it was like, okay, I know that this art is for myself, but I didn't understand that the human response would be, 
I'm connecting with this, or this narrative or this story helped me out in this way, shape, and form. And the more I understood that concept, the more my artistic style changed. The more my artistic, the more understanding of what that concept of contributing to society meant, the more educational, the more spiritual, the more philosophical, the more articulate my artworks became, the more I started to understand that I can make artworks that are impactful. And you know, I'm not trying to like highball myself and be like, okay, um, in the next year, I want my artwork to affect a whole community of people. I wanted to create a whole paradigm shift within our human, like human society. But even having the ability to have people go out of their way to send me an email, to send me a text, or even like DM me and saying like, I really am inspired by the things that you say, or I'm really inspired by your story or your efforts, your determination and just your art style to you know do something different. That's definitely something that uh, really makes me feel good, especially you know when I have people that I looked up to. So when I have other people who are inspired by what I do, it's like, well, you know what I mean. It's, so it's it's a uh, it's definitely a trip. So for this whole collection, the story of Kamikana uh, Okanella. Um, it speaks on my own interpersonal experiences that I've had had in Hawaii. So again, uh, to reiterate, my parents were divorced, um, but they never lived like outside the Chicago land area until my mother um, got a job uh, opportunity on Maui, Hawaii. And you know, I made the decision to stay in Chicago, but my mom left with my brother and sister. So I would go frequently to visit them for like the next five years after they left. And you know, the media portrays a certain culture only in a very limiting way. When you think of Hawaii, when you think of all these other foreign places, you're gonna think what the media has fed you. You're not gonna think what these people are for real until you're actually incentivized to think that way. And that's through conversations that you've had. That's through, all right, I'm gonna go on this island. I'm, I'm done with these tourist attractions. I wanna know where where, where like the joints are at. I wanna know where, where the little spots are at. I want to know all these little things that these tourists don't know, but that the people know. And once you are able to accumulate that relationship, you have a more intimate uh, relationship with the, the land, with the culture, with the way that they even speak, their mindsets. And when you understand this, and then you go to these galleries, that's not there. It's not on the canvas. What they do is they take these mountains that people seen a bunch of times, they take these like fish, they take these like the ocean, they take turtles that people seen, and then they monetize that without actually going deeper into what the spiritual of Hawaii is. And I can be a uh, confirmation to everyone here when I say that the island is definitely alive. You, you, you feel it. The vegetation is alive. You, you hear whispers, you hear spirits at nighttime. I wasn't like in, like, I was on Maui. I wasn't on Big Island. There was no buildings, there was no nothing like that. We were in the mountains. And the silence was just so deafening. You could hear everything. And of course, you know, it inspired me. You know what I mean? I've had experiences where I jumped off of cliffs before. I had experiences, I had, I surfed for the first time like last year. Oh my God, it was so crazy. And it was like all these things attributed to my inspiration. Hawaii isn't something that it's just, you know, sun rays. It isn't just like mountains. It's not like seas. It's something more, much more than that. It's something that's much more spiritual than that. And everybody that has been uh, born and raised in Hawaii, they can understand that. So when I see um, a bunch of, you know, different, type of artists or even uh, galleries that are putting these things on display, it's always the same thing. And you can tell that it's never for the actual people. It's monetizing the beauty of Hawaii without understanding the beauty of Hawaii. So, you know, me being from Chicago, me having this urban-esque style, these vibrant colors, this sort of chaotic-esque ideas that's just splattered on the canvas, it's like, okay, how am I going to take that? And then how am I going to take my experiences with Hawaii, understand the nature of Hawaii, and how am I going to collide the two, right? And, you know, this whole collection was born. So, um, I would say that I would like to dive deeper into how that execution looks like or what that execution 
uh, it looked like for me. Um, so when I generally start a concept for a collection, it always is from my own experiences. I don't, I, I only know, I, I know my experiences best than anyone, right? From my own perspective, from my own insight of things. So that's where I draw it from. And I draw it from, it could be a simple conversation with the person that I've had. It could be a conversation with a homeless person that I've had. And the homeless people, some of the homeless people there are one of the most profound philosophers, I dare say, that I've ever had the conversations with. And having that be drawn to what I want to talk about in Hawaii, there's a lot of chaos there and not chaos as if like a negative connotation like oh my god we're all gonna die like chaos we're talking like <laughs> like again you know how like i don't think i could convince a single soul in this room to jump off a cliff i don't think i can you know what i mean <laughs> and it's like the the, uh, the the way that you know you have to let go and just embrace that fall and for you your feet to break the water from beneath you you feel more alive than you ever did and that's what their constant lifestyle is on a day-to-day -day basis. That's what it always is, and that's what it will always will be. And it's just a vacant lot full of people who could talk about that who don't. And um, so that's what that fire, that there's a repetitive fire motif with these very vibrant reds. Or if you look at this uh, lady with this smoky, like fiery energy thing going on top of her hair, these are the different motifs. These are the different beauties that I've seen in Hawaii. And it's that passion because when I see, think of somebody who isn't bound by any social constructs, when I think of somebody who's very confident in their ideas, I think of fire. You're a very fiery person. You're a very influential person. And their ideas, their confidence warms you. And that's something that I want to try to express in different motifs and in different ways of my abstracted interpretation of what my experiences were and why. And then you have the teal blues, the calmer aspects of things, the, the cliche nature of Hawaii that you've seen a bunch of times in different mediums with the, you know, the hula dancing, the ukulele playing, just the chill vibes, bro. You know, and it's just like the, uh, how you are going to take these natures and intertwine them. How do they look like with each other? What is that supposed to look like? Um, and it's not just those uh, personal experiences that I've had too. Um, you know, me being in love with Hawaii, me loving Hawaii so much more than I thought I ever could, you know, I'm going to go out my way to talk about uh, or to study what their mythos is and what they're trying to talk about and this, that, and the third. And, you know, my, my conclusion of, of the inspiration I want to draw from their mythos were these two really dope goddesses, Namaka and Pele. Namaka is supposed to be, well, they're sisters. They're two goddesses, right? And one of them is supposed to be the god of the goddess of the sea. And of course, when you think of sea, the nature that comes with water, the nice calm-esque thing that's associated with her personality. So you can imagine what Pele is like. And she has had a reputation uh, for herself. Um, she is known to be a very powerful deity that from time to time destroys pieces of land. So I don't know if you guys were familiar with like that whole situation that happened with Big Island a couple of years ago when that volcano erupted, you talk to the locals, they would say, that's Pele. And that, that understanding of who Pele is, is something that is feared, but also respected. So you take these inspirations, you take the fieriness of this person, you take the chaotic nature of that, and you also have very, very, very intentional color palettes to talk about the opposites of Namaka and Pele. You know, you have, you know, some aspects where it's just pure negative space, where it's just teal blue, and all you can see is just this one subject in the middle of all that teal blue. I personally think that that is something that portrays the power of the sea of Namaka, because when you think of the ocean, you don't, it's, you're scared of it, not because of like how the immediate danger of what fire is, but it's the openness. It's just the abyssness of it. Like you're just surrounded, you're engulfed by this water. And I wanted that blue to like breathe a little bit more. And then when you go to the fire aspect of it, oh yeah, you're gonna see a bunch of doodles. You're gonna see this, that, and there. You're gonna see layers on top of layers on top of layers. You're gonna see different textures because that's what, it's just a bunch of stuff going on. Just, you know what I'm saying? So um, these are the other 
like these are all these inspirations, these are all these things that are coming into me that accumulated for about two, three years of my life, you know, just trying to understand how I wanted to execute and understand my ideas and understanding how I want to express myself the best way that I know how and be confident that people are, you know, are gonna like it. Um, and y'all here, <laughs> so, you know, I'm entirely grateful for that. It was definitely a really dope experience. So, yeah, should, should I keep talking about more about it or should I? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, one other thing, so the story of Kamakano Oka, right? As I've said uh, previously, that um, I have had my own interpersonal experiences with Hawaii. And there's this one individual that I fell in love with, actually, I was younger. And it was just the mindset, it was just the aesthetic, it was just the difference in lifestyle and how inspired I was by her presence. Her full name is a mouthful, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it took me like a day to figure it out, but also, again, even the names have meaning. So her name, or at least part of her name, Kamekano Oka Anela, right? Kamekano Oka, right? is a Hawaiian uh, name that translates to the gifted angel or the angel of gift giving. So the idea of it is the story of Kamikano Oka, this angel is supposed to be the embodiment of all of my experiences. Because without me falling in love with her, I wouldn't have fallen in love with Hawaii. And that would be the gift that she has given me. And the gift of me being able to have this inspiration to go out and traverse through the land and understand truly what it means to be on that soil, truly what it means to shake hands and eat and laugh with the locals there, truly understand the quality of the air that I'm breathing. Again, this is like a purely spiritual experience. You know, this is something that can be replicated by, um, you know, painting mountains and stuff. It's not something that can be replicated by, you know, talking about the superficial aspect of things because people who care about those things, who depict those things, only care about you know, the monetary gain because it's the safest depiction of Hawaii. You know, you think of Hawaii, everybody knows what they're thinking about. You know, you, you got the shirt, you're rocking the shirt, you're rocking the ukulele, you know what I mean? You know, surfboards, ah, all this other stuff. And I could guarantee you that, you know, if you're from a land where only people, people only know, not even you, but only the land that doesn't really belong to you anymore, and people have zero interest in the spiritual aspect about it, you would be frustrated, especially if that's a reputation that you can't even conjure because people make that reputation for you for decades. So it's just uh, understanding that there are many different variations of Hawaii. You know what I mean? This isn't like the truth of Hawaii. This isn't like, oh, this is what Hawaii really is, but this is a more deeper, exploration of what Hawaii is outside of the safe zone, outside of all of that. And, you know, mixing it with my own home style-esque, urban-esque style of art, of contemporary art. And it's meshing those experiences together. It's meshing those identities together. It's challenging uh, myself because um, my whole portfolio doesn't look like this. For each concept, for each collection, I want to try to challenge myself further um, into into fitting what I want the rhetoric or narrative to be. And um, it's trying to expand my artistic identity, expand my style and infuse it with different worlds. And this is my attempt at doing so. So this is like something that you know I've been you know, trying to do for like a couple of years and not just with Hawaii, but with like a lot of different things. I'm a very ambitious person and um, you know, this would be one of the first times that I would be satisfied with like how successful it looks, you know? Cause like, I appreciate like every single last one of you guys is like love and support and response. Sometimes as artists, we are cursed with, oh, this is not good enough. You know? Cause you know, we have higher expectations for ourselves than the best of what we can do. So, you know, you have to be disciplined enough to let yourself be happy with what you've done. And once you actually are, and you learn that happiness, like you kind of enjoy the success a lot more because now it's internal now. So, uh, yeah. Should we do, should we do questions? Yeah. <laughs> 
I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, you've talked about the primary colors that you're using that represent the two goddesses. And in some cases, they are predominantly one color scheme. Mm -hmm. And in, some, <clears throat> in other pieces, there's a combination. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at the two pieces directly behind you. Can you talk about that a little bit? Okay. Um, if I talk about this, I talk about this too. I don't think to myself. Um, Um, let's talk about this. <laughs> Good. That's one I want to hear about. Yeah. So this one is um, called King, if you could read. And uh, so there are two incentives for why I wanted to do this. The first incentive was early on in my career when people look at my whole like portfolio and people were like, oh, he can't even really do realism for real. It's like, no, yeah, I can. You know, just like just to be like petty, but also just like, again, the red is the fieriness of it. And the red is supposed to talk about passion. The red is supposed to talk about all of these things. In the context of Hawaii, you know, when you see all of these pieces together, you know what I mean? It's like, all right, this passion lives within this person. This passion lives within this person. And again, this also talks about my experiences of learning different things and different lifestyles and such and such. So when you learn, you know, and you are engulfed by, you know, all these different influences, you start to become passionate yourself. So I just kind of wanted, all right, I don't want no abstracted stuff. I don't want nothing. I want to make a statement. I want to make someone who looks back at you when you look at the painting, and I want you to see all this red, and you're just going to feel the vibrancy of it, and it complements the realism, because what it does is it emphasizes the aura of the facial expression. It's confidence. That one eye, the plain facial expression, that person looking at you, you read, I'm confident in myself. You read, I know who I am. And to me personally, that's what I think a king is, hence the name. You know, so um, I would say that, yeah, it's supposed to talk about extreme passion. It's supposed to talk about, um, it's just supposed to talk about just what a king is and what it's supposed to be. And like, not in like terms of like, um, like masculine, you know what I mean? When I think of king, like the title of king, like I don't really associate feminine or masculine. I just think you are a ruler, you know, and just, I just know what I am. I know what I am about. And I just think that simplicity, when you just look at that face, it reads a whole lot more than if you're just a bunch of mumbo jumbo all over the place. So that's what I, you know, I attempted with this piece. And uh, yeah, so. Um, so like this one and not this one or both of these? Like, yeah. Go ahead and talk about both. Um, okay, so I will just go on to the top one. So the top one is labeled Itepo. And Itepo is actually like a, a native Hawaiian song. It's completely beautiful. When I was um, first in Hawaii and I listened to Hawaiian music for the first time, I could not stop getting that song out of my head. And it isn't even like an official like written song by like a name or like by an artist or something like that. That's not how that works. It's a, a, a song with a story that has been passed down for a bunch of decades that people have remade, remastered, and you know, just made way better along the time. And it was just this one video of a bunch of these Hawaiian native kids seeing like professions and like the harmonization, the vibrancy that you get when you put on those headphones and hear it, it's like, wow. So I wanted to again incorporate that into uh, my collection. And then this, the Veil of Fire, which is one of my personal pieces, my personal favorite pieces. Um, the reason why I wanted to integrate the teal blue in with this fiery thing is because you kind of get a mixture of both, right? Again, hula is inherently passive. It's telling a story. It's replicating motion and that motion of water, that fluid, that fluidity in your limbs, that fluidity in your hips and all the other stuff. But you can't do it and convince people that you're doing it with full oomph if you don't have passion to it, which is why you have that, that fieriness to it. You know, if you look at the facial expressions of the hula dancers, when you feel, because like if you're in a crowd and it's like a wooden stage, when they stop, you feel the vibration. And you really feel the way that they move, like you feel it, you see it, you know what I'm saying? And you, you, and you consume it, you know what I mean? So it's just about, you know, integrating those ideas all together. And this character right here, this, the bro hat, right? It's, it's like bro, but it's like at an angle. The reason why this character is there is the day that I met 
becoming kind of Okada Nella, she had that hat on. Uh. And that's actually a, a very popular like style of hat with like straight brims. You got hats on all the time. So it was like a bunch of cultural references. I deliberately put in a lot of, of cultural references that a lot of people won't understand because if you don't understand, you're incentivized to understand. For example, that cherry piece that are over there with the word cherry, that's that's pigeon talk. In Hawaii, they like if, if you ever heard someone say, hey bro, it's all Gucci or it's all good, cherry is their version of it's all Gucci. So it'd be like, oh, it's all cherry, it's all good, it's all that this and, and then some. And again, it's looking at the piece beyond just the initial whoa. You know, I don't like, okay, making a whoa is cool, but like I want you to say whoa and then think about it. Think about why would this artist put this here? Think about this, that, and the third, and look at every single square inch on the canvas as much as you can, you know? Like I, I like to put in little like little details like that, even if nobody's probably gonna see it, you know. You know, that's that's the beauty of making art for myself. Like, you know, I do it so there's a story there. You know, it, it, it just matters that the story exists, not that it's recognized. It's just it exists in this world. And if people, you know, want to see what that story means or see if there is a story, then that's just icing on the cake, or at least for me. So any other questions? How long did did you um, start and finish this, or how long did you work on this? Since the like middle of 2020. So one of the things that is dope about being an artist who is confident in their ideas is you don't have to rush it. And another dope thing that's dope about uh, uh, being an artist that's confident, you're also not scared to scrap ideas. So it's not that it takes me a bunch of time. It's not like it takes me a bunch of years to make these paintings. I like, for example, I made this piece. I knew where I wanted this piece to be and everything like that. And I did it within three days, right? But where's the fun in that? You know what I mean? <laughs> where's the where's the challenge? You know what I mean? And again, it's not a challenge of technicality. It's I'm making this painting. Do I like this painting? Is this painting something that I want to put on a wall somewhere? Is this painting ready for the people to see? Is this painting something that I feel is satisfactory with? Because again, I am my harshest critic. If you you should see my studio. It's like a bunch of scrapped ideas around in the corner, all over the place. Because I'm like, no, no this is. No. And then I start a new one, and it's a constant battle, right? Because painting one painting is 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 is, is a battle in itself. But when you're painting a whole collection, it's like you're making a giant piece all together. And you're like, okay, this is not complimentary with this. And I know I just spent a whole month on this, but this is not going in there. I, I refuse. So then I'm about to have this other piece that might take, you know, like a seven days. It might take a week. It might take a month. It might take an additional year to make. I have some pieces that took me two years to make. Uh, that one painting right there. A boy meets the Aina. I painted that three times from 2016 to 2017 to 2021. And you know, it's just what is finishing? You know, what does that look like? I had this, uh, uh, I was in conversation with this one fashion designer who told me a brilliant quote, which was Art is never finished, only abandoned because it's always gonna be transformative. And the, like art is a replication of your life. And the moment that life stops is the day you die, you know? So you always are gonna have a new idea. Or you're always going to have a new version of what that original idea is going to be like. So it's just when you're satisfied with it, I guess. And that could take eons, you know? Do you work on a couple at a time? I mean, do you, or do you only do one at a time? I, well, one of the benefits and one of like, you know, one of the benefits of having like a diagnosed ADHD is that I can, I can go back and forth. Like, you know what I mean? I'm like, I'm here and I'm like, oh, and I'm like, uh, 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 you know what I mean? And it's like, it doesn't feel overwhelming at all. It doesn't feel like, it doesn't feel like I'm losing control. Again, it's me embracing that uncertainty because again, I, I have, I have the full access of skill to sit down, draw in a sketchbook, plan out what I want to do, think about the color palettes, and then do it. But again, that's not fun to me.
because I like making art where I let my spiritual take control of my hand. Yes. Not, you know, I, I, I want to be in the ability to, or have the ability to just, I don't know what I'm going to make. I'm going to have like a general idea. And then after that, I'm going to commit to that idea for like 50% of the painting. And then something in my brain is like, damn, I'm not, I don't like this anymore. And then the hard part happens, which is, why don't I like this? And it might be the craziest thing that my eyes has ever seen, but why don't I like this? And it's me trying to understand my spiritual. It's me trying to tame that, that beast within me and having to try to communicate with that beast with, okay, you don't like this because of this or because of that or this, that. And that's like, I don't know, I've been painting for like seven years and I still have that problem. And I don't, like, I don't, like, I don't think it's going to go away, but I don't want it to go away. Because then that makes me feel like I actually have growth. Because I always have something that I need to like overcome. You know what I mean? So uh, it's not like a, it's not like I have a preset of like when it's finished. It's just when it's finished, it's finished. So that's why I like when I like to commit to a show. I do it like years before like the actual day. And I'm like, uh, yeah. Yeah. I have a question. I have a number of questions. <laughs> um, how about a quick one? You mentioned Aang in the last Airbender. I might know somebody who's a fan. Um, can you can you talk about 11, 12, 13 year old you and what you were influenced by besides Aang, what you were putting in those sketchbooks? Bro, lots. The Avatar State was the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. And then just the concept of like bending water. Like I would like have like a cup. Like, like, I'm telling you this, I, I, I used to have like this glass cup that I would just put in front of me and I would just, for like, like 10 minutes, like I was really convinced as a kid, like I was like, okay, if I really, if I think hard enough, like if I think hard enough to the point where my nose bleeds, I'm going to, like, I'm going to move this cup an inch to the right. Uh -huh. and, and, oh yeah, all these things. And you know, what's funny as, you know, I grow older, I'm aware of what I can and can't do, but that doesn't stop my imagination. I feel like I'm always tempted to think the impossible. And the, like the way for me to manifest that impossible is just with this. I think that's the same mindset with the creator of Avatar. You know what I mean? Like, okay, I'm going to make a show that's completely East Asian based, right? In, in each of these sections from like a, a water bender to a, a fire bender to an earth bender to an air bender, it's gonna be different subsections of this East Asian culture that I'm drawing inspiration from. And then I'm going to make that culture be synonymous with the nature that they're been. That's crazy genius, bro. Like, that's insane. And just, you know. Sounds like you have a lot of inspiration from what they're doing. I mean, you can't, you can't if you're making something like this. You know what I mean? You got, I mean, um, yeah. Can I ask a second quick question? Mm -hmm. um, you talked a little bit about this sort of fight between uh, some attitudes of institutional, sort of uh, the sort of the university setting maybe. Can you talk a little bit about this? Seems like you had some experiences with that. And do, are you, now this comes into like a kind of a straightforward question, but like there's the concept of self-trained outsider artists versus, you know, where'd you pick up your skills? All, all self-taught? You, you had some mentors? And I have had like five mentors and then I've had a lot of experiences by myself uh, being an independent creator who understand, like who figured it out by themselves. And then you'll also go to the institutions. And I would say that for each type of method that you learn art, it's a different language, right? Figuring art yourself is not gonna be the same language that you're gonna have when you actually enter the institutions. And being an artist who's like, who has a relationship with the institutions, the academies, outside in, you start to understand that like, institutions and academies, they're like this, right? If you're in the cool guys club, you're gonna be in the cool guys club for like the whole or like aspect of your career, right? I don't care about being the cool guy. I just care about being me. So it's about the way that I want to make art, I had, or to learn art when I was growing up, I had to figure out, okay, but what art do I want to make first? You know what I mean? And I'm, I'm, that's why I was so glad when my dad asked me all these type of questions because I, I had the luxury to think about these things early, right? And again, he fed me a lot of people, like uh, Keith Haring, you know, for example. And I'm like, whoa, like Keith Haring, like this is, he got me a whole book. He, like Keith Haring made doodles of like hell, bro. Like that's not something you should show like your real son. But like, 
it expands into what art is. He shows me a, a bunch of juxtaposed uh, magazines, and it scared me. Like these type of art, this type of art scared me, but I also opened my mind to what art is and isn't. And I think that the institutions really are adamant about what is and isn't good. And outside of that, on the other side of that world, it's just is. And people have the ability to just accept it for what it is without having this entity tell you, oh, this isn't good, this isn't this, this isn't that. And now that we have, you know, social media, you know, we as artists have the ability to control that, you know, and market ourselves and doing all these things. I would say that, you know, I, I've learned it all. Like, I've been through it all. Um, I would say that one of my favorite uh, experiences of learning art was through my uh, mentors, right? And the reason why is because it prepared me for the institutions. It really prepared me for um, uh, the academies, you know? Like, before I entered the academy, I was painting murals when I was like 17, right? I had to paint murals, and I'm scared of heights. So can you imagine like painting mural on a 10 foot wall? Like it was the crazy, it was like, like whoa. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really fond of that, but it prepared me. It, it, like even when I would like mop the floor and my, my boss would like leave his door open and the way that I would hear him have conversations with like uh, the Bears, like the Chicago Bears Stadium or like, or Red Bull, like the actual Red Bull brand. I'm like, okay, so that's what my value is as an artist. Okay, so this is how I'm supposed to talk to these people. Okay, this is, so it's like, the institutions can only take you so far. And even artists that are straight institutionalized, they also have their hiccups because it can only teach you so much because you gotta understand the agenda. They are not training you how to become your own independent person. They're training you on how to fit into galleries to make money off of you. That's what that is. So you're gonna be completely limited to that. I am by nature a hard head. You cannot tell me what to do. You cannot tell me how to make my art. You cannot tell me how much my art is worth. You cannot tell me how to create my story, this, that, and the third. And the institutions know that. So it's them respecting my art, but also respecting the boundary that I set for myself at the same time. I think that as an artist, that is something that you need to aspire to have. Because now you don't have people who are obligated to take commission pieces or a commission percent off of your work, like from a crazy rate. Like I've seen some art pieces, or not art pieces, some art galleries that take 50%. That's 50% of months of your work. That is 50% of you staying up until three o'clock just for that passion. That is 50% of all that blood, sweat, and tears that you've experienced to immortalize in that painting. They don't, they don't deserve that. They don't, I'll, do, I'll run the show my damn self. <laughs> when I, yeah, when I first when I first did this art thing, I wasn't into the like industry. So what I did was I know somebody who had a dance studio that let me rent that out for two hundred dollars, and I just have all of the people who know me just go to there, and now I can put that on my website. Like, yo, look how many people came to see my stuff. You know what I mean? I'm purely you know independent, but I also have. The business literacy too that is very important too uh, i was just having a conversation um saying that as an artist you can't only identify yourself as an artist you have to identify yourself as a business as well because businesses have rates businesses have policies businesses have rules and businesses when you have that infrastructure know which and uh which businesses are good for them and which businesses are bad you are in a capitalistic society, so you have to go by those rules, but you don't have to compromise everything that you are, which is the luxury of freedom. So it's balancing all of these things and truly understanding your value as an artist. And I would say that mentors are pretty cool, but YouTube is cool too. It's just, you just pick your cards pretty much. So, yeah. I have one more question, and then maybe we'll wrap it up so that people can approach you um, individually. Is you're here in Brainerd, Minnesota. Why is that important to you, and what does how does that fit into your long term vision for yourself? I would have never thought. <laughs> <laughs> I would have never thought that me painting something in my house could give me the access to be somewhere miles away from my home. 
I was telling one of the staff uh, earlier, I saw a moose for the first time. Uh. A moose. Like, like, I'm from a place where there's only buildings, pigeons, and rats. <laughs> I was under the assumption that a moose was about the size of a horse. No, it's a beast. <laughs> and, like, just to have the ability to have people who like my art so much that I get to have the ability to come out, travel all the way out here, and have the ability to talk about my vision is just dope, you know? I have a little brother and I have a little sister. And um, as I somewhat mentioned, you know, you know, uh, I used to paint a lot. And the reason why I used to paint was because that was the best way I knew how to express myself for reasons. And my brother and sister were also there to see those crazy experiences that we had. My life has been, it is very dramatic. So I said to myself one day, screw it, bro. I'm going to be an artist, right? Because I've always liked to do art. And I'm going to prove that with all this work, dedication, and focus, you can make your dreams come true. And I never did it for me. You know, I did it to set an example for my little brother and sister. Because my little brothers and sisters are also creatives. We have it in our blood. You know, my brother does music and my sister, she expresses herself through cooking. Not like macaroni and cheese. Like, no, she knows how to throw it down, bro. Like she knows she knows how to like like make tacos. Like, but like not like I'm going to Walgreens to buy tacos. Like, no, she knows how to make it from scratch. She knows how to like bake the dough and everything like that. She knows like I wish I could give you more exquisite like uh dishes but I can't pronounce it but I pronounce it but like you know what I'm trying to say and it's, it's just um the ability to show them yo I'm telling you you put this much hours in you understand how the game works you understand all this it can happen it can happen and for them to say yo Trotter Alexander is my elder brother and for people to be like what and being like, yeah, I'm so proud of him. He does this and that and the third. That's more of a, su a success to me than anything. So that and then being out here, oh my God, it's so crazy. Like it's great out here, you know? So, um, yeah. Well, we are thrilled. Thank you for being here. Yeah. yeah. Ha, 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 ha.